Welcome, everybody. I am Ann Pasternak. I'm the new Shelby White Leon Levy Director of the Brooklyn Museum. Let's take a poll for a second. When do I stop saying I'm the new director? It's been one year. Is it two years, votes for two years? One year? Oh, that's so unkind. How about five years? Well, I'm really excited that you're all here with us to celebrate two exceptional shows by three exceptional artists. Of course, Marilyn Minter's retrospective and Jeremy Deller's project, his collaboration with Iggy Pop. So right now we're gonna hear, and momentarily we're gonna hear from Jeremy and Iggy. And I just wanted to share with you a little bit of background about this project. When um, Jeremy told me before I arrived at the museum he had a great idea, I didn't even know the idea, I just said let's do it. I, I, I swear to God, I'm not supposed to tell anybody that, but it is true. Other artists in the room do not listen to that. I had the pleasure of working with Jeremy when I was the director of Creative Time on a project called It Is What It Is, Conversations About Iraq. Some of you may have known of that project, you may have seen the installation at the New Museum, but it was basically an RV that traveled around the country with a US soldier who had done three tours in Iraq, Jeremy, and an Iraqi soldier who had served in the Iraqi military. And at a time of war, talking about, um, talking about uh, the people that we were at war with. You also probably know, or many of you probably know, about Jeremy's legendary project, The Battle of Orgreave, which changed my view of what art could be and what an artist could do. And perhaps you read this summer about the beautiful, haunting, performative memorial that Jeremy orchestrated to honor the lives of the British who served in World War I as it made international headlines. If you know Jeremy's work, you know why I make it a point just to say yes to him and make it a point to see him whenever I can. So at that time, about 14 months ago, Jeremy shared with me a dream. He told me that Iggy Pop was a huge influence in his life, not only because he's an icon for punk and rock music, but he's given us all countless moments of joy and profound inspiration, while he has also been an icon for liberating the idea of male sexuality and identity into a more fluid, identity in courageous, bold, direct ways. So with Jeremy's dream in mind, last December I met with Iggy, and in March Iggy bravely posed for 22 artists who gathered at the New York Academy of Art, and Iggy was the unannounced model. The artists ranged in ages from 18 to 80, and their drawings are accompanied by sculptures from the permanent collection of the Brooklyn Museum that were selected by Jeremy to take a look at cultures from around the globe over millennia and how they approach the idea of masculinity. I want to recognize and ask the artists who are with us who participated in the life study class to please stand so we can applaud you. On behalf of the museum and Iggy and Jeremy, we're really grateful for your participation in this project. Now, Iggy needs no introduction. He is a singer, a songwriter, an actor who began performing in the 1960s. And in 1967, he formed the legendary band The Stooges, which was, yeah, which was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame just six years ago. And it significantly influenced the trajectory of music as we know it today. Iggy's concerts are also legendary. They are so high energy, so intensely strenuous, he defines giving it one's all. In March, Iggy marked the release of his 17th album, Post Pop Depression, to critical acclaim, and he has taken a break from his world tour to be with us today. I also want to recognize in the audience Jim Jarmusch, who has just released his new documentary on Iggy. Congratulations. <laughs> Sorry to call you out, couldn't resist. I also want to thank a few friends for helping to make this project a reality. There was generous support for the exhibition by our friends Mike Wilkins and Sheila Dugan, The Fund, Shane Aykroyd, Phil, Sher Phil Ahrens and Shelley Fox Ahrens, Kathleen and Harry El Elsesser, Christina Enriquez Bocabo, Gavin Brown's Enterprise, and Charlotte Fang Ford. Thank you very much to our donors for joining us on this journey. I 
I hope that you'll all check out the book that accompanies this exhibition that's published by Henry Publishing. And I also want to thank our awesome staff at the Brooklyn Museum that pulled off this project in record speed. I want to recognize Alicia Boone and my public programming's team. Alicia, where did you go? I want to thank Emily Annis and Exhibitions and most of all the project's curator who dove in with me on this, uh, this wild ride, our director of exhibitions, Sharon Matt Atkins. Sharon, thank you very much. Now, I'm ready to begin, and I just want to say that this conversation tonight is going to be moderated by a dear friend, my friend Tom Healy. And if any of you have seen our new Brooklyn Talk series over recent months, then you already know Tom, because he's not only a great poet, he's a really surprising, unexpected, uh, brilliant moderator. And when he looks at the world, whether it's through his writing or through these interviews, he too is seeing very deeply. So welcome to the stage, Tom Healy, Iggy Pop, and Jeremy Deller. Hey. Welcome. Hey. Hey, Jeremy. Hey. Hello. Good evening. Iggy, thanks for being here. So um, there's an amazing scene, that funny scene in Cry Berry B, where you're sitting in a kind of giant bucket. And beef you say, cake, oh, yeah. you caught me in my birthday suit, buck naked. Uh, that was in a book of stills from the 50s in John Waters' yeah. collection, a much beefier guy than me <laughs> doing that. So here you are, though, caught but... Oh, me. in my birthday suit in again. In your birthday suit. Well, I, I think everyone needs to feel comfortable at least once in their birthday suit before they check out. <laughs> so uh, it's my time. <laughs> so, Jeremy, talk about this, because you... you asked Iggy about this easily a decade ago, and he said... <clears throat> it was about 10 years ago, I approached him through someone, and I, the idea was explained, and you were intrigued, but it, you weren't quite totally convinced, and I think you came round to the idea, because I approached Iggy 10 years later, and then it was like, yes, I'll do it very quickly, he agreed. So one of the interviews, when you said you changed your mind, you said something really profound to me that um, you used the metaphor of having weight. Yeah, I didn't it's have the weight yet. That's what I felt. Can you talk about that a little? Well, look, I use, uh, I use my body, as a lot of people do that work in public, uh, as a kind of object of commerce, frankly. When I, when I go out and do a gig, uh, somebody has to pay for the presence, and that's a certain gig. When you're still, when you're still pushing a hype like that, you you lack you lack cultural weight until you get to the end of that story where everybody knows you really don't have to anymore, right. except for an interior reason. I wasn't there in 2006. I was. Uh, it was just starting to rain good things on me, but it hadn't taken its course. So there was that, and there was also, uh, I was in the middle of finishing the job with my original group, the Stooges, that I had failed to complete in the 60s and 70s. And I picked that up later in life uh, largely through the instinct that uh, I wasn't going to respect myself and other people weren't going to respect me unless I finished the first job before I went on and did what I'm now doing, which is I'm finishing the job on me. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't done yet either. Uh, we, In that case, it was helpful that I kept at it and kept at it. Nothing would stop me. Uh, even uh, when uh, you know, when uh, even when Ron passed away, I uh, went ahead and continued the group with with James, the uh, second uh, Mach two guitarist, right. and eventually it helped us in the real world to get the support of an institution yeah. like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it helped. Mm -hmm. It helped put the group in a less sordid light for the general public. Right. 
<laughs> that's so, how that's important. Uh, and also, every story needs an arc. If you've already been sorted, you don't want to continue. <laughs> ah, great, and more sorted from these guys. You know, no, you need an arc. So when you've been so bad, there's only one way to go. You've got to be good. <laughs> so, and, you know, the, the Hall of Fame is a family institution. And one of my other considerations <laughs> when, uh, hey, that's what it is. So, hi, welcome to the family, all right? I'm in the family now, and so are, so are the Stooges, and that's a good thing. When uh, it was Gavin Brown, the gallerist, that's who wrote me originally about Jeremy's idea, and he also s proposed that it would, he sort of spun it as a gallerist will. He said, and then we'll give the, we'll give the drawings to the Smithsonian. And I thought, <laughs> am I George Washington quite yet? <laughs> I don't think I qualify, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, so I investigated a little uh, he sent me a beautiful book that Jeremy collaborated on called Folk Archive. Yes. Alan Lane, is, was Alan he your? Kane. Alan, Alan Kane. Alan Kane was yeah. his collaborator. It's a wonderful book that treats uh, quirky English folk people and folk customs, things like uh, a small village that has a monkey's tea party once a year. They set, they set out, they, they, you know, yes. they advertise, monkey's tea party tonight, you know, and, and they set out these little tables for the monkeys, you know. But he, he, they did it with the right blend of humor, casualness, and seriousness, a great book. So I liked that. And respect, respect. Uh, yeah, I liked people. that, but when I investigated a little farther, I realized they were gonna offer the drawings also to the Smithsonian, and I thought, well, those bastards will probably turn me down, you know? So, <laughs> so another big part of it was uh, when it came up again, I, I met Ann Pasternak. She, she uh, reached out when she was in Miami, and uh, this was somebody, she, she's, a, she's a pistol, you know? She has, <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> she, has a, she had a good energy, and she was definite about what she wanted to do. And I thought, well, Brooklyn, yeah, I belong in Brooklyn, you know, so, yeah. I lived, uh, I lived in Bensonhurst for a year when I was very poor, because I couldn't afford Manhattan anymore, and um, I used the B train. I lived on uh, 86th Street near 20th Avenue in a ground floor unheated flat, and, uh, and it was a great experience. Did the, I did the album Zombie Birdhouse yeah, yeah. at that time. Yeah. Awesome. That, the phrase, the Zombie Birdhouse was my way. I was a little angry. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it was my way of describing how people live in Manhattan, basically. In these, everybody gets a little cage in a right. <laughs> very large stack of <laughs> dwellings. And, and do you do what you're told like a zombie and keep going, <laughs> you know, so. So anyway, that's finally I said, all right, let's do it, you know. And also, you know, I, Jeremy keeps doing fine arts. I thought, well, this is a good person to associate with. Right, right. So, right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, say, what were you going to say, Jaren? Nothing, so, I was just oh. saying thank you. Oh. <laughs> so, no. So I have a hunch that I want to try out with you that one of the things you have said about working with uh, the artists who are here, and let's give another round of applause to all the artists who are in the show. <laughs> one of the things that you say uh, in an interview is how this is an exchange that you're ready for. And this, uh, the whole sense of, of posing for other artists. And what struck me is like trying to think what that is. And, and it occurred to me that a real power of why this worked is not simply that here's the body of a celebrity, and, but it's 
the balance between its exchange because they have this rigor and discipline and work, and you just talked about it, about a job, and you have the same mm. approach to art making. Yeah. It's not all about spontaneity and imagination. It's also, as, as a drawing class of anything teaches about art, it's about discipline and technique and rigor, which is your whole career shows that too. And that kind of gets lost sometimes in a celebrity bubble, but that aspect of your personality and your career show up, I think, in this show. I, I think that I can tell you, at least for me, on, I've been photographed many, 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 many times. And as the equipment gets more sophisticated, it feels more and more like an assault. There's somebody's, it's, there's something mean about it that I don't like. Right. And uh, I avoid it more and more. Like somehow, this, some guy's got it's a motor drive, you know, he's got this little clicker, and, he's, uh, and, and it's incumbent on you to kind of stand up to that. But in this situation, everybody was busy. They were as busy as I was because here's this uh, naked man in front of you, and if you don't feel anything, or if you can't draw at all, or if you don't, okay, get down and do the work now because the dude's going to leave, then you have nothing. So there, they were, each, each one of them you could feel was very, in, totally engaged with his or herself. Mm -hmm. uh, what I, my biggest concern going in was, geez, I, 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 just like, you know, I wanted to make a good first impression. <laughs> that was, that's really the, it's, it's a human exchange. So I was concerned with how will we meet each other before we start. Right. Or, or at first I thought I, maybe I'm supposed to walk in and I was like, okay, how's my walk on? Do I walk in with a big cape on and then fling it off? Or, you know, how do, how do I roll this, you know? And, and then it was, it was Jeremy who suggested, well, why don't, why don't we all just meet up first, clothed, in an adjacent room? And that was wonderful. That was like, uh, it was like a nice day in the high school I never went to. You know, that's what it was like. And everybody was, everybody was, we were all just, we, we were at a good time for about 15 minutes meeting each other. Right. And then it was like, ah, you know, and I think, they felt, hopefully, like I wasn't some kind of dick. And um, that's the way I felt about them, too. Right. <laughs> you know? So yeah. then everything could proceed, I think. Yeah, I think it was important. There's a sort of mutual respect between you and the, and the, the drawers. Yeah. And it was just, I mean, it, was, it kind of broke the ice, I think. Because I think there's probably a lot of expectation between them and you. And so it was just a, a relaxing thing, I thought. Yeah. And now, if... If I'm right, as many as like a third of the people until they were told the night before that it's Iggy Pop, when they were told, about a third didn't know who you were. Well, people don't, you know. And <laughs> I'm not that big a deal. <laughs> yes, but that's interesting as well. I right. think that's good that you have people who are drawing you for, as for who you, for your body and who you are, not, not for any idea of you. So yeah. I think that was important. Right. What was the biggest surprise to you as you thought about this for a decade, Jeremy, and then here it is, it's happened? Well, the biggest surprise was that it happened, I think, uh, and also that once it started, the atmosphere was like being in a, an exam room or a library. It was very studious, quite intense, I felt, and everyone was really working hard. It was silent as well. There was no sound at all. It was really very for intense. four hours? Yeah, four hours. Well, we had breaks, obviously, but right. it was just yeah. very silent, very serious. Yeah. And everyone took it seriously. And could you talk about that time? So have you, you haven't posed for that length of time before, have you? Mm, I've done horrible <laughs> photo sessions and music videos right. that where they, it goes on and on. Oh, my God. Yeah, you know, yeah. They used to, it, uh, much longer, but uh, not as focused or productive, right. frankly. So one of the things I was really fascinated by because you're told to hold poses for lengths of time and such, and 
he, the curator said, well, Iggy got these because he, once he knew the amount of time, he had a song in his head that matched that time. You could know, all right, the pose is going to be up now. Yeah, I was concerned. Uh, it's, it's, I'm, not the very, I'm not the greatest person at sitting still. And um, I knew I was going to have to sit still for 20 minutes, nude, <laughs> seated, you know, um, with a bunch of people, you know, concentrating on, uh, on what I was going to be able to give them. And I didn't want to be thinking, have thoughts going through my mind like, I wonder if it's two minutes or if it's actually 17 minutes. And I didn't want to, what is the, uh, God. Ah, there's a great, uh, the guy who does spoken word uh, records and he has one about time, a guy that wakes up in the middle of the night, what's yeah. his name? Okay, and he's like, oh, what time is it? I don't know what time, anyway, <laughs> I, I didn't want to be thinking about that. So I know, for instance, <laughs> The recorded version of I Want to Be Your Dog takes three minutes and 22 seconds or whatever. So all I had to do is in my, I could be sitting here like this, and you wouldn't hear it, but in my head it's like, dun, dun, dun. And you just do it Yeah. And you just do the whole thing. And you do the <laughs> verses and the choruses, and then at the end, I'd sing the guitar lead to myself. Yeah. You know, I know them by now. You know, and I would just sort of, okay, we got a three and a half minute song, and then a six minute song, and then, and then I finally, at one point, I said, "Is it time?" And then, boom, the bell rang. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> was, Within so, a second, he got yeah, it. Yeah, I wanted to see how close this. So that was a good way, I thought, to get through it without breaking concentration, because I, I thought I owed them concentration for some reason. I mean, one thing I noticed in the drawings that every person, I, I've seen a lot of figure drawings before and they tend to concentrate on the bod, but every artist gave me a face. Yes. They all gave me a face. Yes. And bless you for that, you know, <laughs> thank you. you know. So, so we have a few images here. So this is uh, <laughs> that was me too damn lazy to go to my room between <laughs> the takes. I said, I'll just lay down here. <laughs> you know, I'm nude now. What the hell? You know, that's and and yeah. he liked it. Yeah. So he said, let's let's draw that. Yeah. So who chooses the poses, Jeremy? How does that? He did. Well, Michael and With I. Mike, Michael I think, ran yeah. the class. I knew I wanted a variety. And I, we had to have a long pose that was seated, really, mm -hmm. and something that looked quite heroic, I felt, you know, holding something like a sort of a mythological figure almost, or a warrior. Right. Uh, but we needed a variety. I wanted to get lots of, uh, uh, to begin with, I wanted like four quick poses, so I knew I had some drawings for the show. In case everything else went wrong or you wanted to leave, I just thought, at least we'll have something quickly. <laughs> so we had, uh, we had, uh, a lot of drawings quickly, so we got yes. like, the song, like doing songs quickly, and like right. uh, almost like hit singles almost. And then we had the long sort of concerto or sonata or whatever, you know, the long piece. And that's where all the very detailed works came from, you know, the seated ones. And Iggy, do you have to just let yourself go through all of it, or do you feel like one of the, no, this pose is going to suck. This is not going to work. This that is wasn't my place. Okay. So uh, what so I tend to do before I do any before I work with anybody, I, I try to think very carefully about, okay, I'll go over here, but I won't go over there because that's their turf. Right. And, there, and also, while I, I might, while I might be busy interfering with Jeremy, I might be blowing a responsibility of my own. I've, mm -hmm. I've learned from experience. So, no, I just, you know, the seated pose, I mean, that was, that's tough because, you know, why is I'm that? thinking, well, you know, here's my penis just hanging, <laughs> <laughs> hanging over the side of a box, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and you know, you know, there's, you know, the, the, it, it emphasizes your middle girth and the whole thing and, oh my God, you know, but that's okay, you know, that's okay, <laughs> you know. There's always, 
I think it's more than okay. Yeah. These drawings are beautiful and it- Well, they, yeah, uh, there's always room for a surprise in my life. I don't know how that works, but uh, I just get a lot of good ideas and input from others okay. that I would not be able to get on my own steam. Well, yeah. thank you. But I read once where you actually said two, two important things you, you learned were uh, from Mick Jagger that it was about performance. It was work. You make a performance, you do a performance. And from Jim Morrison, you have to have surprise for there to be. I th I'd say those are both the true and those are two two different traditions. I think um, James Brown, Tina Turner, uh, any good any good black church leader, preacher that you see, um, they they work it with the crowd. The more I think about the best performance I ever thought saw of of Jim Morrison, that was the, a kind of comedy. There was a lot of comedy in that, and uh, Guy had a great sense of humor. He really did, and then he was able to combine that with uh, with a, a beautiful voice and a beautiful presence. And the band, the band was very fine, you know. Yeah. He wrote well as well. Yeah. He, I thought he was a good writer, some people didn't, but I think he was very good. But so there was comedy in a guy, yes. <laughs> you know, the first time I saw him, it was, a, it was a homecoming dance, the University of Michigan in a field house. So it was, you know, the men of Michigan with their <laughs> dates. And uh, the group came out, They'd had a hit, but they hadn't coalesced into a slick working band yet. Yeah. So they play the first riff, and it sounds a little weedy, and he's supposed to come on after about eight bars. He doesn't come on, he doesn't come on. And when he does, you know, the song was Soul Kitchen, and when he does come on, instead of singing in his sexy baritone, he's singing like this. <laughs> <laughs> made these uh, <laughs> gestures sort of like your cat when it's rolling on its back, you know? And, and, he, <laughs> and he was dressed up, dressed to the nines in ruffles and leatherette, and his, he had his hair oiled like Hedy Lamar and Samson and Delilah. I mean, he, he looked <laughs> wow, but he was obviously whacked, you know? And he was whacked, big pupils, but it was beautiful, you know? And the guys, the guys in the front got madder and madder because they took this as an, as an insult because he couldn't complete a number. Right. So they tried another number <laughs> and, <laughs> and another number, you know. And, and also it wasn't, at the time, their sound. It was smooth on the radio, but as rock music, it was revolutionary because right. most rock at the time was supposed to be more lashing and slashing and masculine. This was not a sensitive stuff. So they, the crowd started to approach the stage. Things were not going to be pretty, and, and it was a short show. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the second time I saw him. So you were how old then? I was, that was 1960. Right. I was 20. 20. I had just, yeah. no. I was either, I think I was 19. Okay. I think so. And I just felt like I was trying to get a band together and figure out how to do something creative. And after I left that show, I just said, there's no, if they can do that, I have no more excuse. <laughs> uh, you know, so it was like that, you yeah. know. And the second time I saw them, it was in a Kobo arena, a large arena, and they were slick and superb and had their finger on the button. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I remember the, I remember the little folk mess better. You know, <laughs> right. that's normal. <laughs> All right, let's look. So you talked about the face. I love this this image because it really looks hewn out of out of stone. Yeah, I, th I think I say Mount Rushmore in the book. Yeah. May I see, where is Deidre? Where is she, she here? Yes, right she here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> All right, right on Deidre. 
All right, so we, you have been posing for a long time. The one image I actually wanted to have was Gerald Montagnas, but we can't use it for, but you speak about that in a really powerful way about, about what is at risk in a certain way and, and the coldness of that, the kind of theft uh, of that kind of sitting. Uh, it, was, it struck me that there seems something really um, harsh about it that probably would have this, this one was tougher than, really? the, than the Malanga. Okay. Although the Gerard was mentally tough, this was tough because it was, I think the, it's a Richard Bernstein piece, but I think the photo, I think this is Bill King. I think okay. so. And it was, uh, I remember the shoot was like, it was like a Vogue shoot. They put you in a white room and it's a guy who's shot hundreds of people with long necks and you know, whatever they have. <laughs> and, and you're young and you've never been to New York City. And so you, you can see I'm kind of trying to, I'm trying to stand up to this guy a little bit, yeah. you know, and, with no clothes on, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I thought it was important. Um, somehow to me, I just thought it was important to, uh, uh, I knew I was going to perform for a living, for a vocation, and I thought, so I thought part of that was to document what was at the root of it. In other words, no boots, no saddle, <laughs> no hair gel, whatever it is, you know. And right. uh, so that was why. I did it a couple of times and then left it off until this. I wanted bookends, basically. Yeah. And so what happened, so I put this, um, Jeremy, talk a little bit about this. For people who haven't seen the show yet, there are a number of, of works from the Brooklyn Museum collection that are also in the show, all male nudes. And one yeah. of them is this Sheila self-portrait well, that, I, to I my mind, looked like Iggy. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, I always wanted the exhibition to go to a museum that had an encyclopedic collection. I wanted it, I always wanted the work to be seen in the context of world culture, not just... And as a gift, you said. As a you, gift, right? yeah, as a gift. And it, it, it would reside in one of those great American museums that has an encyclopedic collection, like Philadelphia or Detroit or wherever, and, and the Smithsonian. But, um, but also I was, so I wanted it, with this, I wanted to do an exhibition about the male nude as well around, from that collection. And I thought it was important to, to show these drawings in a context, to, sh to show that they do exist in a context, and they're part of art history. And now these drawings are part of art history as well. And also, when you consider the roots of rock and roll music, it's not necessarily Western. They're not necessarily Western. It comes from other countries. And I just felt it was interesting to look at male nudes that looked at religion, but were sacred and profane at the same times. And that's, again, something that was very important to the genesis of rock and roll. So I just wanted them to have a really good home in a really great museum and uh, had other great objects in, not just 20th century European white art, basically. Having said that, that is 20th century yes. European white <laughs> art. I apologize, but there is others, as you know. So it just had a different, but it couldn't be in the Museum of Modern Art, it had to be in somewhere that had a, 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 a breadth to it, but also the kind of museum you'd go to as a child or as a young person, and you'd be absolutely amazed by a Buddhist temple in one room, some Egyptian sculptures, a Renoir, or Monet, or whatever, and you'd go, and you'd just time travel around the world and around time in a museum like this, like mm -hmm. the Brooklyn Museum, basically. Mm -hmm. So Iggy, could you and I were talking earlier about that, so when you started drawing and painting yourself, and you were in Berlin, and you had some time, could you talk about that a little, what that? Yeah, I went, David Bowie took me to, it's a wonderful little museum, I, it's called the Brooke. And um, it was on Clay LA near the, uh, in the American sector. It was a very, very small space. Uh, maybe the entire museum is not really bigger than this full proscenium. And uh, it, m most of the works were not physically large works. And it was Eric Heckel and Schmidt Rotloff and the whole German expressionist bunch yeah. and uh, I don't know it just I looked at it you know and I mean uh, it didn't it 
it wasn't, they didn't try it all to be figurative, but you could just see from the color and the slash of the lines and everything, it was like, yeah, this is what this feels like when I look at it. Or this, and that was, that was wow for me. And there was something a little bit like cartoons mm -hmm. about it. There was a bit, uh, the Dix is in that museum yeah. as well, who actually Dix, draws yeah. a lot like a cartoon. So uh, it just spoke to me, and I, I sort of paint like that, kind of. I mean, it's because I, I can't draw the way that I don't have the eye that uh, these wonderful people had, but I have feelings about the things I see or mm -hmm. what's going on inside, you know, so I draw that way. Mm -hmm. and we have an Eric Heckel in the exhibition as well. Yes. I don't no. know if it's one of the slides, it's and it might be. I'm not sure if it's yes. yeah. oh, You don't have to go, it's fine, yeah. but I mean, I love that work as well, so. I, I'm looking for, these are. He had a, Heckel had a painting in We'll go back to some of these. We'll oh, well, here's a class. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's beautiful. Yeah. This is See, all that's, so beautiful. That's like an expressionist painting. Right. A drawing of it. So these I are things taken by class. Maybe we don't have oh, it. There we, we go. We, we took, I it. think, some of the others <laughs> out. <laughs> so. Um, I love this one as well, yes, actually. Yes, talk about this, because you're talking about cartoons. And well, things, Kinley, so. Kinley was doing, did some drawings, obviously, but then he was doing some little caricatures. And at the end of the class, he was going to throw them in the bin, I think, or do something with them. And I just said, don't. I want these. And he said, great mm -hmm. to have this. I love these. Um, but he, they're sort of doodles almost. But I just thought it's, like, it's just another way of looking at a face and a body and, a, and another way of drawing. And I think he does have animation. And so that's why it has that sort of that feel mm -hmm. to it, cartoony feel. So when I first saw the works this week on the wall, it was astonishing to me because they feel so three-dimensional and, and they, they kind of move. Uh, so could you talk about, for, because there's a beautiful book, but those reproductions are nothing like yeah, what this totally is. Yeah, it's totally different. What is that? What happens? I don't know, and I think it's very hopeful for museums because it means you always will have to go to a museum to see something. You can't just rely on the internet or books mm. even. Mm. You have to be in a room with a thing and walk around it or get close to it and see it next yeah, to someone else. Actually, that's, and yeah. it actually, it being in the presence of an artwork, is, there's no um, replacement for that, despite how clever we are with yeah. technology. So, and so tell me what went through the... <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Like if you see the... If you see the Velasquez yes. in the Prado, yes. it's not the same. It's, you know, it's just not the same. Yeah. He's holding that same. Well, this this is one of. Uh, so this is an extraordinary. I love this. These two. Mauricio, yeah. What was that like holding? Holding the staff. The staff. Oh, I mean it. You know, your thumb starts to. <laughs> throb. I mean, there, you know, there are technical aspects to yes. holding the staff. You know, I don't know. I understood. I, I got it. Right. You know, I understood. Well, it could be a scepter. It could be a spear. I thought of it mainly as some sort of a spear. Or then I thought, well, maybe it's just a device to to uh, make visible some of the infrastructure of the bod. You know. Because that's part of that's yeah. that's what's supposed to be behind yeah. the figures is sure. the yep. musculature, the tendons, the ligaments, right. and organs. Yeah. So I didn't. I was. I thought about it briefly, but you know, mainly I just. I did it as I was asked. Right. You know, but when they asked me to do that particular, I thought, oh yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> and I just did it. You know, like you do. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. But yeah. uh, it was at. Uh, <laughs> it was a, I did want to find an open pose, I suppose you'd call it. So, f as you know, it's, it's kind of full frontal pose. There's yes. Guno's drawing is somewhere. You might want to. He, 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 he got the kind of the best. If you go back, where, where is it? Keep going. Keep going. Oh, that's a great. There we go. I mean, obviously, that's kind of the most open yes. pose. And uh, I thought that was important to have that with the like arm. Out. You know, you needed the arm out. So. Can you go to the next picture, actually? The, is it the Lenny Sinclair? No, go back. Oh, back. I'm yeah. sorry. This one. No? Right no. here. Go for, that's it. Stop. Yes. This, I bought this photograph in a 
record shop in Detroit for two dollars fifty, but it was mm -hmm. stuck on a piece of paper. It was a greetings card, and it was signed on the back, Lenny Sinclair, about ten years ago. She's she's a great little yeah. artist. Amazing. And then yeah. you see this the tongue out, and we were talking about satyrs and wood sprites and all that stuff. And I just thought mm -hmm. this is the kind of persona, your stage persona, is really in this photograph. Ready well, made I, I was thinking about this, Iggy, when you were saying every story has an arc, because there it is physically at the performance. The, mm. the arc of the body, mm. the prow of the ship, you know, mm. there's surprise going to happen in this show. Well, I used to do that. I, I liked watching James Brown and also Joe Tex, uh -huh. who's very unsung. But uh, James Brown used to do this thing where he, he would throw the mic stand down, twirl, and when he twirled around, he'd have it coming back up with a little foot move, like dum, dum, pop, wow. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, hmm. What, how about if I, I would dive head first? I'd try to figure out how, f what's the length of my own body plus my arms, and I'd see if I could drive, dive and catch the mic just before I was gonna <laughs> hit the deck. <laughs> and that's the moment after. Then what I would do, and I would, <laughs> then I would slither up the thing, and I thought, hey, that's a, a stage move, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's what I was doing. And did yeah. was. You know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hey, <laughs> you know. Well, actually, you, you write and talk so beautifully about this whole range in, in, in your, the experimental nature of a lot of the work you did. I, I love when you said, well, you know, if you take a vacuum cleaner with your thumb. I mean, it makes the sound of you the whistling You can make the sound of a whistling, you know? the whistling said, wind, well, yeah. a wearing blender with some water in it, yeah. you've got Niagara Falls. And what surprised me, I never imagined when I used those things, I was using them, these, making these sounds to enhance the very simple wah-wah guitar riffs that Ron and Scott were playing on bass and drums, just very, Primal, simple, a little funky for white fellas. And, uh, <laughs> and, but uh, I wanted to do something besides sing in a sort of a monotone manner as I did at that time and still kind of do. So I thought, well, what about this, some beautiful sounds? And I, I thought that when I did these things, everyone would concentrate on the sounds, but instead they were like, that guy's played a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, oh my God, this is, this is an outrage. <laughs> they, they play a vacuum cleaner, but it wasn't, you know, that's not a big deal. It was a beautiful sound. Later, I, I got rid of the vacuum cleaner and brought an air compressor when I got a little money, right. you know, because <laughs> that was much better, you know. But, uh, but that was the idea. The wearing yeah. blender was, I had failed it. Uh, Harry Parch had a, something called the cloud chamber. Yes, and, he, with the yeah. water. <laughs> and I tried to build one of those and it, with a broomstick handle and some spring water bottles and it crashed one day. You and actually I, tried your own cloud yeah, chamber? Yeah, okay. yeah. And I was hitting it with little mallets and it was beautiful, but it, it, was, it was not sturdy. So I thought, oh, what about if I just buy a wearing blender, an Osterizer, I think it was, or so for 27 bucks and put a little water in it and mic it up. It might, and it did, it sounded, so it was beautiful, yeah. you know, so to me. It was to me. Yeah. Jeremy, do you uh, agree with me that this, uh, this elemental thing of, of that experimental kind of, uh, the way of making a gesture, another thing in, in Iggy's performative work is related, it feels like it twins with what the drawing class was I and what drawing um, is. Yes, it's very basic. It's sort of the bedrock of exactly. our history and of painting, his drawing. Also, I think his performances are very, I think, closely related to a lot of early performance art and uh, body art as well. So there's an influence there. So there's, there's a lot of art going on. In a, in a sense, but, but definitely those performances, and of course early rock and roll as we know it, is, is the, the building blocks of everything that's come since, anything with the guitar. And you were sort of part of that, you know, the second wave of that in a, in a sense. So that's very important as well. So that, you know, the elemental and the drumming, you're right about the drumming, that, uh, the very, that very funky drumming yeah. or something is very important. So I was very, yes, I was interested in him 
and that role that he's played musically, but also sort of physically. And it was important for you with the artists who came that not only did they work with the figure, but specifically did they had experience in life drawing. Tell us about that. What, how we got the people, how we found the students or the participants? Well, or, the, or, or what their backgrounds I were. I wanted a real mix of people. I didn't want to just use one class from one mm -hmm. college. I wanted to use a group of people and because I knew then I'd get a, 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 a diverse group of people in sort of ages and backgrounds and so on, and also how long they'd been drawing for. So I wanted to have a, an, a, a, a group of people that reflected this, this part of the world as well. So that was important. And that happened almost randomly because we were just looking at work and when you see everyone, they turn up, it's like, wow, we've got people. We didn't know how old these people were, a lot of them, or where they were from or anything. So for me, it was very important. We had a group of Americans looking at an Ameri another American mm -hmm. and documenting a fellow American. I felt it was really, a, it's a, so in a way, it's a piece about America in the, in the 20th and 21st century. And that sounds a very grand statement, but it's, it, for me, that was a very important thing that we had a group of Americans looking at one of their fellow Americans. Right. And so all of your work has really had an experience of community or family or large groups. Was there some dynamic that changed over the time? Of the, did the artists influence one another? Did you feel something that happens? I don't know. You'd have to ask them that. Mm -hmm. But I think everyone's so concentrated on their own work. That's how it seemed. And very, very... I mean, there's a real, like I said, a real concentration. But I think you have a group, there must be a dynamic within the group, and that helps everyone. And I think everyone seemed to get on very well with each other, and were very supportive. So the atmosphere was a really great atmosphere. It wasn't tense at all, even maybe a little bit before, but actually everyone was very happy to be there. And Iggy spoke to people in, in the breaks, and I think, you know... Did you peek at the drawings? Did, hmm? did you peek at the drawings between... I, w I didn't peek, I just went over and looked at them. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> and kind of wanted to, I don't know, I just wanted to meet people. Right. So it's just a natural thing, and sort of, hi. Oh, you know, like yeah. that. Yeah. Like that, you know. Uh -huh. I was interested, I mean. <laughs> yes, and I, I felt really good to be there. Yeah. And as the thing went on, I just felt better and better. And it was like, I, I don't know what it, I don't know what the load was that I got rid of, but it took a load off my mind. It did. Of yeah. some sort. I, that's something personal. I, I don't really get how that works. <laughs> you know? yeah. So we are going to open up to some questions. Here's a question right here. And the mic is on. Hi, my question is, why Iggy Pop? That's, that's, I can answer that question quite easily. Uh, because I felt there was a few bodies in America that have been so public in showing themselves to the American public. I mean, there's obviously some people that do it for money, and in the sense they just, uh, uh, now on Instagram and so on, just show their body off. But someone who'd used their body and had, uh, was willing for their body to be seen over a period of time and to change, and also a body that really embodied, no pun intended, uh, the culture that it came from, from you know, that uh, really embodied uh, rock music and was symbolic of it. So I felt it was a hugely important body in America, probably one of the most, if not the most important body in America. And I felt it had to be drawn, and I felt the drawings could do it justice in the way that photographs can't. And uh, so it, there was no, it wasn't like I didn't have a list of people to, draw, to have drawn. It was just one person, basically, I wanted. Yes. Um, thank you for coming tonight. I think it's a great project. Um, so I wanted to know if you could talk a bit about your experience posing mm. serenely nude, as opposed to versus your performances where you're always, uh, you know, high octane performances where you're skirting with the idea of nakedness and you know what what it felt like for you to to go from one extreme to another, like. Must. Yeah, well, when, when I'm working or playing uh, live, then uh, I'm a sort of a technician with feeling. I, there are both aspects going on. 
and uh, there's a lot goes into it. There are a lot of considerations every moment, and I'm definitely putting it out. I'm putting it out and I want it back, but I'm, I'm on. In this situation, there was none of that. I, I didn't think that approach was gonna work for me. I was gonna have to try to, I was gonna have to get these people to perform. It was incumbent on, I was gonna have to try to inspire them or trick them or <laughs> do whatever I had, could do to make them interested enough to perform. And this was something, I just kind of felt it. I didn't think about it. And I had to put myself in their hands completely because sure, everybody, you know, it's, there are reasons we don't all walk around with no clothes on all the time. <laughs> and yet there are societies where people do, but not ours. <laughs> and that's, that's something to think about right there. Um, so I just tried to drop, I just didn't think about myself in any way except that I asked for a spot to look at and then just tried to just sit still. And I, I was trying to make sure I didn't have a, a sort of, uh, I wanted to make sure there was some energy in my mind so that there would be some in my face. And that, that I used the, the convention of my songs where I'm comfortable going through my head. So there would be some expression. So I was afraid otherwise it would be, because uh, <laughs> that happens to anyone. Sometimes you go slack in the wrong, if you're in the back of a cab for two hours or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> so that was it. And, and I felt, I don't know, I felt cleansed of something when I left. And, uh, and we all, I don't know, everybody had a big smile at the end of that session. It, you know, it wasn't like, hee hee hee, it wasn't like <laughs> that. It was just everybody, I think everybody had a good session. That's what mm -hmm. I thought. That's about it. It wasn't a gig. So while the next person comes up with a question, I was asked a question just before we got on stage. I said, all right, uh, it was essentially said this way, you're three white dudes on stage, and this is the year of yes for uh, the museum, a, a celebration of um, 10th anniversary of the Center for Feminist Art and a, uh, a look at women in the arts. And so how does this show, uh, how is it part of that? And uh, Jeremy, yeah. Oh, you want me to answer that question? Yes, go right there. <laughs> Jeremy is the mastermind of this. I'm just well, it was To be honest, it was ne for me personally. I, I, it was never intended to be that. But I can. I think it's you know it's a it's a exhibition. You know, it's an exhibition about a body. It's a, a body that's sort of, in, in some ways, been under the amount of sc intense scrutiny that only usually women's bodies are. And it was yes. quite interesting when we we had some comments on social media when we did this and we l released some photographs and some people were saying that's great others were saying oh my god what what what's going on this body this guy why are you drawing him and in a way you sort of got an, an idea of what it is for a woman to be examined and sort of be judged on a body of a certain age in a certain way but it was really i think um i would i would say really it's more it's about sort of it's a show about a, a body and about the sexuality of that body as well, mm -hmm. and how it's been viewed through time. So, I can't exactly answer your question, right? But um, I always saw. I suppose there's a sort of there's another element of kind of an asexual element about it as well, mm -hmm. about the body, about the way it's used. I partly have an answer, which I think is question more than answer as well. But I I think there's a really brilliant pairing of this show with Marilyn Minter's. Mm terrific uh, exhibition that's opened just down the hall from yeah. this. And uh, Marilyn will, will, there'll be a number of programs with her. She's an extraordinary artist. I hope she's here. But uh, part of what seems to happen is that, is that there is a conversation of 
what, what Marilyn does so brilliantly is take control of a number of the tropes and uh, abuses and controls that the male gaze or even the commercialization of the women's body from the male gaze has done to it and made extraordinary art from it. And the art made for you is actually this vulnerability about that male control and that turning was, it over. That was the word I would have used and I think uh there's someone named Frances, what's her last name, who wrote the wonderful... She's probably here, and I can't... It's, it's Bowles... It, she wrote a very... Yeah. Yes. Yes. Give us a wave, Borzelli? Francis. Um, yeah, anyway... Yeah. Uh, she, there she is. Yeah. Bottom left. Is that you? Yeah. Hey, no? It is, it is <laughs> okay. her. Yeah. She wrote a... She wrote a... a very perceptive and interesting history of life drawing in the middle of the uh, the booklet for this uh, for this yeah, thing, it's terrific. And uh, <clears throat> you know, I learned that you know this this started out in the Renaissance as a kind of a your your task was to uh, was to illustrate uh, beautifully the what they thought was the important history of mankind, which was always you know, the religion and the great heroes and blah, blah, blah. It had to be beautiful and had to be technically superb. And this, it was always men that were the objects. You could not do it, never, never a woman, right. for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, at first, because women were considered in those inferior specimens, right? Because they were fleshy <laughs> and, uh, you know, whatever. And... Uh, then that somehow things switched much later, things switched over and the idea in France of the Bohème and uh, you know, she's my model but also my lover. And uh, then the male gaze of course in the whole fashion industry of today comes from that and then she sort of put, and with this exhibition in steps Iggy Pop to this whole, <laughs> you know. So where does that come in? And, you know, uh, I knew that at 69 years old, I was not gonna be, uh, uh, this was not gonna work if I tried to make myself the object of the male gaze. <laughs> yeah. I did that pretty well when I was 29 years old. Uh, but uh, that's, this is different. I, don't, you know? I think you're pretty hot. Maybe, well, so. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, I think the chick has always been in the vulnerable position. Yeah. But uh, it, you know, it's kind of fun, guys. You should try it. <laughs> <laughs> hi. Hi, Iggy. So, hi. Hi. So I'm a representative. It's not a really question, but I'm a representative. I'm here for representative Japanese one to ask you to get to to come to Japan to have a show as a part of post-pop revolution. So I collected a thousand of petitions from Japanese fans. So may I pass here? <laughs> this is may, a, you may mean, I pass here? She has a bunch of signatures yeah, on a petition. I guess so. <laughs> Bless yeah. you. Bless you. Thank you. So please, thank you. please come thank to okay. Japan. All right, thank you. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Iggy. <laughs> hey, man. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thanks for all the music because, man, you made my life so much better. <laughs> and I, right. I really can never <laughs> thank you enough for it. Uh, I've done the uh, live model thing before. Uh, were you cold? You, you what? You do model I, things? I, I've done, I did it 20 years ago. You used I, to be I, a model. I, and I was just, I did it like twice. And I was really cold. That's what I remember. So I don't re remember. I was just asking, were you cold during your uh, freezing. cold freezing? Cold. Oh, cold. Cold, yeah. It, it was a little cold in there, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they gave me a, they did try to give me a break, I remember. They talked about that due to my, you know, well, <laughs> they gave me a break. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. Yeah. <laughs> I know. You got the you got the short end of the stick, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well we got the long end of the stick, so uh, thank you, Iggy. Thank all you. Right, thank you, Jeremy. So it was really, really cold in there, so it gives you a sense of how impressive Iggy is. <laughs> so 
I wanted to answer Tom's question for a second because all of their answers were great about how this fits into a year of feminism. As you know, at the Brooklyn Museum, we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. For an entire year, we're devoting the museum to the lens of feminism. But it's not a fem feminism of, of my generation or my mother's generation or my grandmother's generation. It's a feminism for the future that takes a look at gender equity, inclusion, and equity as, at large. It's a civil rights movement. And so everybody fits into this movement. Everybody fits into feminism. And Awesome. So I want you to know that Marilyn Minter is doing a marathon of interviews here next week. We hope to see you back again. If you haven't seen the Jeremy Deller Iggy Pop Life Class exhibition, it's up on the fifth floor. I urge you to see it. It's fantastic. And also Marilyn Minter's show. And I thank you all for joining us tonight. And thank you, Jeremy, for your brilliant vision. Thank you, Iggy, for all the inspiration. And Tom.